I have explained in previous conversations how the CIA has an arrangement with the Las Vegas casinos. They like to keep an eye on who has the money and who doesn't. A lot of new money pops up occasionally. The CIA needs to know about it. Now, but this today's story is a little different. It is about how the CIA had action in a gambling boat that I once worked on in Florida. I was a dice dealer there, blackjack dealer, roulette dealer, Caribbean stud poker, and whatnot. Mr. Rivalwick vouched for me. Now, the owner of the boat was a guy by the name of Liberis, but the owner of the casino was Casino Austria's, and they had a board member. As you can see right here, the board member was part of the CIA. <laughs> it says right here, he was on a mission with the Central Intelligence Agency at the time that Liberis claimed that the Europa board give him, give him a, you know, a lucrative options to buy many, many more stocks in the company. Now, like I said, the real name of the casino owner, the name, they were Casinos Austria, a bunch of Germans and Brussels people out of Europe. And uh, if they, uh, the name of their boats, they called their name of their boats the Europas. Now, if not for the lawsuit that Liberis filed in a power struggle for the gambling boat empire, I would not be allowed to tell you this story, but it's all public record now, so I can throw in a few personal stories and add them to the mix. Trust me, some of them are pretty juicy. And what's a good CIA gambling boat story without a multi-million dollar security fraud money laundering case thrown in for good measure? And now, and now you know where the blacklist creators get their Raymond Reddington stories from. And you might be wondering, why would the CIA be involved in gambling boats in Florida, keeping tabs on mob gambling and mob and gamblers? Well, anyhow, well, you never know. They might need them for a job one day. You never know. Keep your friends close and keep your enemies even closer. Okay. The year was 1992. I survived Hurricane Andrew in a Fort Myers Beach bungalow. Talk about living life dangerously. Every flim-flam con man within a 500-mile radius came on our boat to gamble. Hell, even Jerry Cooney, the heavyweight boxer, he came on the boat one day. Uh, he didn't really gamble much, but he came into our break room, and I asked him, I said, Jerry, when are you going to make your comeback? He said, not in this lifetime. Most of the dealers that worked the casino gambling boats in Florida, they were there because they were run out of Las Vegas or Atlantic City for one reason or another. The gambling boats back in 1992, they, they did not have security cameras. There was no eye in the sky. Uh, things got a little crazy. It was like the Old West, you might say. Um, I, I had a good, friend, a good friend of mine on the boat. He was, a, he was a dealer. He had a little problem with psychedelic mushrooms. One day he got so he had so many shrooms in him he couldn't even deal. We had to take him to the top of the boat. Somebody had to keep an eye on him so he didn't fall off the. the it was crazy. Anyhow, he uh, he once gave a Vietnamese shrimp boat owner. He was a player on the boat, and he gave this Vietnamese guy a royal flush in Caribbean stud poker on the very first hand of the night. Yes, they split ten thousand dollars between them. The pit boss was not amused at all. He told the dealer that he had to take a drug test the next day or get off the damn boat. Uh, he chose to get off the boat because, you know, there was no way he was passing any drug test. Let's go back to that Caribbean stud poker game for a moment. Remember I said the first hand my buddy gave the player a royal flush the very first hand. <laughs> it was no accident, trust me on that one. But re remember these Caribbean stud poker games and a lot of these other uh, games, table games. They have progressive jackpots. Remember, you, you bet a dollar on the jackpot, the progressive jackpot, and if you, the dollar, you get a royal flush, you win the jackpot. Now, these progressive jackpots are supposed to go up and up and up for every dollar you bet, but uh, remember, this is the wild, wild west of gambling, and I can tell you that on the gambling boats in Florida, a lot of times they made it to like $10,000, and they did not go any farther. <laughs> There was no $100,000. There was no $200,000 progressive like there probably should have been. They got to $10,000 and they just stopped. Okay, that's I probably shouldn't say that, but that's what happened. That's what That was reality. So, okay, talk about uh, poor gamblers. That Vietnamese shrimp boat owner, he, uh, he lost his entire boat on our 
by gambling on our boat for about two straight months. He was on the boat every day for over, like, had to be two months. He lost everything. He had, uh, and then on, when he did get the royal flush, he had to split the winner, winnings with the psychedelic dealer friend of mine, okay? But the story gets a little crazier for my uh, crazy dealer friend. He then went down south to Key West. He got a job on a gambling boat in Key West, but the problem with stealing on that boat is that it was John Gotti Jr.'s boat. Yeah, you know, John Gotti, well, John Gotti's son, John Gotti Jr. owned that boat, and after they found out he was getting it on there, they well, they made a they made they gave him a phone call. They called him up. They called him up and says, "Hey, we're going to chop your fingers off when we catch you." <laughs> the crazy bastard. He laughed about it. He, I I couldn't believe it. He laughed it off. Now I don't want you to get the idea that everybody who worked on these gambling boats was uh, some sort of you know wise guy. You know, no, that's not the case. I there were some good people that worked on these boats and they kept their nose clean. And uh, one of them was a good friend of mine, Lester Bullock, and he ended up moving up the uh, chain of command pretty high there. And he ended up uh, being, you know, owning quite a few shares in this company that I uh, used to work with. Now, Lester Bullock, like he, he was second generation gambler, gambling family from Las Vegas. He was strictly on the up and up. He wanted to do everything the correct way. And Lester Bullock even told me a crazy story about when he went to Aruba. They got a casinos down in Aruba. Lester Bullock was hired as a general manager. General manager is a pretty big job. And uh, he saw that there was some money laundering going on in the casino he was working at in Aruba. So he called the owner in America to let him know, hey, you got some money laundering problems going on here. Before you know it, they had Lester Bullock and his whole family face down with M16s in there at their head. They, the, the Aruba police, the Aruba military police, crashed in through his house and at the middle of the night took their passports. Anyhow, the moral of the story is uh, if I was you, I would not gamble in Aruba. But anyhow, I met Lester Bullock uh, on the gambling boat in Fort Myers. We were both dealers at the time. I knew Lester before he moved up and became... Uh, ownership management material. So let's move on to Gus Boulis. Now that's another interesting story down there in Florida. Gus Boulis, he bought his first boat in 1994. Now that was two years after I was down there on the fun cruise. Now you got to understand that the casinos Austria people, the people from Germany and Austria and Brussels who owned the casino that I worked in, they named their casinos Fun Cruise with a K, okay? Now, Gus, Gus Brulis would come on to the, uh, our boats, and he would, uh, he would pick the operation apart. You know, he would say to himself, I can do this. I can copy that. I, I can't. That ain't, that ain't that hard. I can do it. And sure enough, after a couple years of studying us on the Fun Cruise, Gus Brulis bought his own boat in 1994, and he build up a gambling boat empire. Unfortunately, he was uh, mowed down, assassinated, and shot by the mob in February of 2001. I guess the moral of the whole story is how people who work in the government and people who work in the mafia, sometimes, you know, they rub elbows together. For example, Gus Boulis was assassinated in 2001. He was dead. And, but by 2006, Jack... Abernoff, Jack Abernoff was a lobbyist in Washington, D.C. He was in prison for his underhanded dealings in buying the Sun Cruise gambling empire. So, for example, take this lady here, Deborah Vitale. Now, she had nothing to do with the Bulis thing. I don't want anybody suing me. But I want you to, I want you to know how these people operate. This lady here, Vitale, she's, uh, she used to work for the FCC. So what I'm trying to say is when they come after you, sometimes if, they, if Jack Abernoff wants your company, and they did want the uh, Gus Boulis gambling empire, they wanted his empire, and they went through him through government channels, like you know the, they use the FCC lawyers, and they ended up forcing Gus Boulis to sell his gambling boat empire through some small print. This is how these, the government and the uh, mafia cronies do business. They found out that... When Gus, under the license that Gus had to operate these ships, 
uh, there's a little small print that you have to be an American citizen, and he was not an American citizen. He had the names of the boats and his girlfriend's name, and by the time he became an American citizen, anyhow, they forced him to sell. That's Jack Abernoff for you. Jack Abernoff uh, went to prison. I mean, there's so many weird names in these stories. You got Michael Scanlon, press secretary for Tom DeLay, Jack Abernoff was a lobbyist. Uh, they hustled Indian tribes for $80 million. Adam Kadan, Kadan, he was mob. You got uh, Moscatiello, he was a John Gotti Gambino associate who ended up being involved in the murder of uh, Gus Bullis with little Tony Ferrari. And, and I guess I should mention that little Tony was John Gotti's cousin. <laughs> cousin, I guess. Before the mafia and the government tried to take Gus Bullis' gambling empire away from him, he had like 11 boats, I believe. I think at the time there was like 26 gambling boats operating down there in Florida, off of Florida. 26, and Sun Cruise owned 11 of them. He had over th he had 30 vans picking up gamblers from a 500 mile radius to cart them off to the gambling boats. And uh, I, I guess this is a good time for me to mention that uh, there's a difference in international uh, water lines there, the international lines. See, if you're over on the east coast of Florida, say Fort Lauderdale, you only have to go three miles out before you reach the international line where you're in international waters. And of course, once you cross over into the international waters, you can gamble legally, right? But over on the West Coast, over where I was at in Fort Myers Beach, you had to go out seven miles before you reached the international uh, water lines before you can gamble. It took us, uh, it took us over an hour to get out there. Uh, our boat actually took an hour to get out there. Whereas on the East Coast, it only took like a half hour to get out there. The reason why I mention this is this has to do with oil, big oil wrote the laws on where the international uh, water lines are. Well, I've rambled on too long about this subject, but I'll leave you with this. The Machiavellian power struggles that went on down there, it was sort of, it's surreal. Think about it. Gus Bullis, before they assassinated him, he owned 11 boats. And uh, the thing is, with this guy, uh, Liberus, though, the Liberus, he, he owned the boat that I worked on. But he did not own the casino. That casino was owned by Casinos Austria. Like I said, these were German Austrian people out of Brussels. And, and they even sent a guy in from Brussels one time. There was, a, like I said, we had some uh, suspect dealers on our boat and there was a lot of cheating and stealing going on. They even, they sent a guy from Brussels down to find out who was cheating. Uh, I guess the whole thing about this power struggle is this guy, Liberus, who owned the Europa that I worked on, I mean, with a little bit of luck, he could have been a Gus Bullis, and he could have went on to owning 20 or 30 gambling boats, and who knows, you know, but the CIA, you, they end up using a, a guy from the CIA. That's how they, they, that's how they per, persuaded the judge to not give Liberus uh, the option to buy all these share, shares because they said this guy was with the CIA. He was on a mission and, of course, the judge is going to say, oh, you could not, they could not have promised you those options because this guy was on a CIA mission. <laughs> I mean, the whole story almost sounds ridiculous. It almost sounds like something you'd see coming out of Hollywood. I mean, actually, they did make a movie. In 2010, they made a movie called Casino Jack about this whole situation that I just described.